You're listening to the My Simplified Life podcast, and this is episode number 125. Welcome to the My Simplified Life podcast, a place where you will learn that your past and even your present don't define your future. Regardless of what stage of life you're in, I want you to feel inspired and encouraged to pursue your dreams, simplify your life, and start taking action today. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac, and I'm excited to share my stories and life lessons with you while taking you on my own journey. This is my simplified life. Hey friends, welcome to another episode. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac. By now, you know I'm a big believer in therapy. I adore my therapist. Shout out to you, Lisa, if you're listening. And I think it takes a strong person to go to therapy because it's work. It's a lot of work. It's about investing in yourself. It takes time, money, and a lot of reflection and action. Some of it may sound like things you would do with a coach. So what's the difference between the two? My guest today is clarifying all of that and more for us. Host of the Driven Woman podcast, former psychotherapist turned coach and mentor, Diane Winger. Diane is someone I instantly clicked with and basically I fell in love with her the moment she started speaking. She's my kind of people, a no BS, tell it like it is, go get them woman. She's going to break down the differences between a therapist and a coach and who should have which one at what points in their lives. I'm also sharing my therapy experience and what's so special about my therapist. So this is certainly a conversation you won't want to miss. Hi, Diane. I have so been looking forward to this. Oh, not as much as I have, I promise. (laughs) All right, let's not compete. That's a bad vibe. (laughs) There are no bad vibes between us. I I know that for a fact. (laughs) To that. Can you introduce yourself to everyone who does not know who you are? I am Diane Wingert, no BS therapist turned business mindset coach for female solopreneurs and host of the podcast, The Driven Woman. That's a mouthful. And yet you were concise and to the point. I practice a lot in front of the mirror. (laughs) Not really. (laughs) So you were a therapist and I love that because, oh my gosh, if you were my therapist, I don't think that I would ever hang up or I'd be like, can I have bi-weekly calls, multiple weekly calls? You know, what's really funny is that I thought when I stopped being a therapist, sold my practice, closed up shop and started working with people as a coach, I thought it's just a little pivot. You know, I've been helping people for years and now I'm just going to continue to help people, but with a different title. And instead of face-to-face, we're going to be interfacing with a computer screen. It actually turns out that it's quite a bit different and I wasn't really prepared for that. A lot of people think they're the same thing and I guess I did too. And then I kind of learned the hard way they're not, or at least they shouldn't be. But people ask me all the time, you were, you were a therapist. Why did you become a coach? Anybody can be a coach, which is kind of true. Nowadays, it is pathetically true. Everyone's a coach. <laughs> yeah, I'm a coach, you're a coach. In fact, I think there was an article by that name. Well, because it's an unregulated field, as you know, and that means that even though the ICF, the International Coach Federation, is trying very hard to become sort of the mandated or or at least uh, the approved of um, certification body, there are no restrictions. Literally, anybody can be a coach. You don't even have to be an adult. And you don't really have to know anything either because the thinking on the interwebs is that if you are three steps ahead of the person you're helping, you are an expert to them. I'm like, isn't that what we used to call the blind leading the blind? I'm so (laughs) confused. I'm so confused about the way. And even if you're 10 steps behind the person, like we were talking before we started recording the the 20-year-old life coach, you you can't. It's just, that's like an oxymoron. You cannot be 20 years old and be coaching other people on life. And I can say that because I'm twice that age and I still don't know it all. Actually, I'm a little bit older than you. and. What I've learned is that the older you get, if you are actually, if you actually understand the assignment, to borrow a TikTok phrase, 
you become increasingly aware of how little you truly know. And that should make you wiser and more humble. It doesn't work for everyone as we have (laughs) ample evidence of, but I think um, the youth generally think they know everything and then they actually start to grow up and realize, oh, maybe not so much. And life has an interesting way of driving the point home if you're not paying attention. So if you live long enough, you might be completely stupid by the end. (laughs) I love that. It reminds me of my six-year-old because he's like, I know everything there is to know about everything. Like, I don't need to go to baseball practice. I know everything there is to know about baseball. And then we'll throw him a ball and he can't catch it. And we're like, well, maybe you don't know everything, do you? Yeah, I guess I better go to practice. (laughs) I love the bravado, though. I think that's just exceptional. In fact, are you familiar with the meme, Michelle, just be like Chad? Have you heard of that? No. Okay. Enlighten me. One of the things I talk about a lot is... Because I work with women who have been successful in corporate, nonprofit, or academia, and now they've had the audacity to start their own business and become an entrepreneur, and they're struggling and they don't understand it because they are accustomed to being successful. Now, you and I have both made that switch, and we know that success in corporate requires a different skill set than success Mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur. So a lot of women struggle with what I call the unholy trinity of procrastination, perfectionism, and people-pleasing, which will really F you up as an entrepreneur, but you can probably get away with in corporate. And be like Chad is, Chad is sort of the quintessential, like totally average dude who thinks he's God's Mm -hmm. gift. And this goes (laughs) back to an article that I often quote called The Confidence Gap that was published in Atlantic Magazine February 2018, I believe, that says a man will apply for a position when he meets 50% of the criteria that they're Mm -hmm. asking for, whereas a woman will not even apply unless she meets 100% of the criteria. And then she'll consider herself lucky to get an interview, much less the job. So Chad is just like this nondescript, mediocre, totally average dude because he's been conditioned as a male that he thinks, yeah, I should get this, no problem. Whereas women who are way overqualified in many cases won't even try. That is some seriously screwed up stuff. It is. I'm, I'm going to be more like Chad in everything I do. <laughs> yeah, and don't raise, don't raise the Chad, okay? I'm just saying you got, no. you got a little at home, so there's still time to save the That's why we generation. still throw the ball and let him know that you no. don't know it all, so bring it down, brother. <laughs> yeah, you actually suck right now, so feel, feel that, you know? Just <laughs> embrace that for a minute. Oh, my parenting skills sound amazing, don't they? <laughs> Oh, I, we don't even want to go there with mine. Like literally, I, I tell you, I'll tell you a funny moment because I'm still really close to all my kids. And when you hear this, you'll wonder why. But my my oldest son would be very fond of having tantrums in supermarkets. And why I ever brought him with me is beyond me. But I would take him into the store and he would want things and he would try to hide them in the cart. So maybe I wouldn't notice and I would just be so busy in my mom brain that they would get scanned through and go home in the bag and into his mouth. But I would usually catch him and say, no, we're not getting that. Well, if if he couldn't persuade me or prevail upon me to get him what he wanted, he would start to pitch a fit. And I mean, full scale, ear splitting tantrum time in the middle of whatever market. And you know, markets are big and the acoustics, because we both are in audio, like it's super freaking noisy. And I didn't give in. I literally stood back from him and looked shocked and surprised and said in a very loud voice, my, aren't we having a big tantrum here? Look at all the people looking at you. Aren't you embarrassed? Now that was probably a little advanced because he was only four, but I think I was on the right path. Like, you know, take responsibility for your actions. Don't be an ass. And I think he turned out okay. <laughs> probably I would find that same. in any parenting books though, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I would do the same. I call them out like that. Public shaming is very effective for adults. And I think we got to start them when they're young, you know? That's how I feel about honking the horn when I'm driving. The kids will be like, why'd you honk? I'm like, because they need to know that they should have used their signal. I'm letting them know that they did something wrong. (laughs) Ah, Do most of them get that or do you get the finger or? They pretend like they didn't even hear it or didn't see me. Uh, 
it, it, it's truly amazing in the area that we live in. <laughs> well, you're in California, so there's so much that we can both say about that, but we just won't. Yeah, yeah. If there was somewhere else we could move to that we loved, that we knew of, that had good schools, we would go. So mm-hmm. <laughs> there's pros and cons to everything. So tell me, how when did you decide to go from therapy to coaching? Like what sparked that in you that you're like, you know what, forget the couch. Let's let's go coach some people. That's such a good lead in. You would almost think that I queued you up for it. I actually <laughs> had an entire coaching program in uh, in my mind and on a whiteboard and on a Trello board called Couch to Coach with the number two. Look at me. It's like I read your mind. Right? <laughs> Psychic friends hotline. So it was really... When I got to the point where I I had crawled up the food chain, oh, let me back you up a little bit. My first career was in medical sales. And then I had kind of a significant event. I had a pretty bad car accident, which left me with a chronic pain problem I've been living with since for many years, but um, it primarily affects my head, neck, and shoulders. So I was in outside sales. I was on the road all the time. I did a lot of driving and that was really not going to be possible for me anymore. So I took some time off. I did some volunteer work at a family service agency working in a domestic violence program. And I thought, wow, I'm really good at this. I really love this. I had a super shitty childhood. So I have plenty of experience with trauma and abuse and neglect and all that. So I thought this is made for me. I spent probably 25 years total in the field, worked in public agencies, hospitals, community mental health centers, nonprofits, group homes, and so forth. But the last five years of my career, I had a very nice private practice in Southern California, working primarily with women. And almost every one of them came in with a diagnosis of anxiety or depression or relationship difficulties, low self-esteem, fatigue, and all this. But I discovered that almost without exception, that they all suffered from perfectionism, insecurity, low self-esteem, lack of confidence. And the area that I worked is kind of nice. And I was shocked at how many of these women were highly educated, successful, um, people that I'm sure everyone else in their life admired and thought, well, she really has it all. She's put together, she's smart, she's savvy, she's got a nice house, nice family. But on the inside, they were all thinking, I suck. Mm -hmm. And what I realized, Michelle, over time was therapy was actually not the ideal tool for helping these women because to be a good therapist, you kind of have to join with the client in their view of the world. You have to be their support. Their, their cheerleader, the person who always believes them. And sometimes the mindset that these women had were the very thing that was holding them back. And I increasingly found myself wanting to challenge them, wanting to confront them, wanting to provoke them a little bit. Mm. And I realized that I was getting a little bit frustrated talking about the past, talking about what wasn't working, talking about problems. I was much more interested in talking about possibilities and potential. And I was working with a therapist myself on and off over the years until I worked with my first coach. My first coach was a business coach. Then I hired a different business coach. Then I actually hired a personal coach. And that was when I realized, oh, you've actually evolved out of this role. You want to work with people who have graduated from therapy, but they don't know it yet. So they keep coming. And therapy graduates who are no longer traumatized, who are no longer living from a place of fear, abuse, neglect, or any of that, they're healed and they're healthy, but they want more they should stop seeing a therapist and hire a coach because the coach will take a person who's actually doing okay and wants more. Therapy is really not the right thing for that. I mean, therapy is the absolute uh, treatment of choice 
for abuse, for addiction, for trauma, for loss. But once you go from an open wound to scar tissue, I really don't think therapy helps you move forward. In fact, I think it keeps you in a place of, in a way, being stuck because you're no longer hurting, but you're not really thriving either. So I started firing my clients and saying, you know what, you don't need this anymore. You, you really need to just go make friends, start dating, get a better job, dump your husband, like whatever. Like you need to start leveling up and us talking about what got you here isn't going to get you there. So I went and got a couple of years of coach training and realized, yeah, this is the difference. Now, let me just say at this point in time, be a little controversial here. I no longer fit with most therapists, but I also don't fit with most coaches because most therapists don't know actually how to help people reach goals. And most coaches don't know anything about mental health. And most humans have some combination of a need to address both. Mm -hmm. So I'm in kind of that no man's land where I know too much about human nature and mental health and trauma to be blind to that like most coaches are, but I don't want to be a therapist either. So do I sound like I'm totally confused or? No, because it's funny as you talk about it, you remind me of my therapist because she's also a coach and it was something that drew me to her as my therapist because I went, oh, you know what? She's going to understand also my role as a business owner and the online world. And that was really one of the the key factors of why I chose her. And because we could go through my childhood, my trauma, you know, all of these experiences. And then she could say, you know, what's going on now? And then I could tell her all about my work business and work and, you know, what regular life is like and combine the two. You know, because she sees over the past couple of years, she says, you know, I've seen how in working on the therapy part, how it's actually translated to my business as well. Mm -hmm. And the newfound confidence, the I'm just going to go for it. You know, it's definitely been this mixture. And for us to, you know, I'm, I would say, I guess I'm quote unquote healed, you know what I'm, as you were saying. And so I don't see her every week or every month. It's like once a quarter, a Mm check-in, you know, because I don't need that. So I have kind of graduated. If I need it, then she's always there. But there's definitely something about the combination of the two and most therapists not having, you know, that one aspect or the, the coach not having that other aspect. You're unique and that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. I um, I think also when you are a coach who doesn't have any mental health training, sometimes what you're trying to do to get a client to move to the next level, it's an expression a lot of people use, they will actually um, end up triggering the person's unhealed trauma issues. Mm. You know, telling somebody you got to double down, um, you need to go all in, Uh, those kind of expressions and like challenging somebody, they may be afraid of doing whatever it is you're challenging them to do for reasons that have nothing to do with being committed to their business goals. It may be your approach. It may be the words that you're using where you are actually triggering a trauma response and the person then shuts down. I've seen many people you know, called out by coaches as not being committed or self-sabotaging when actually this is a trauma response. A friend of mine, Nicole Lewis Kieber, is a therapist and coach, and she specifically works with entrepreneurs on trauma issues. I didn't realize until I met her that a lot of entrepreneurs have a trauma history. And Mm. once you really understand like how many of us, we just don't fit the mold, we don't really like having a boss. Well, sometimes the not liking having a boss is because you had abuse from an authority figure in childhood. So anybody who tries to tell you what to do triggers that response and you're not even aware of it. So I think, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who would never go see a therapist too. Um, because that unfortunately you're proudly proclaiming it here on a podcast for anybody to listen to. 
unfortunately. The millions of listeners around the world. Millions of <laughs> listeners, yeah. Worldwide audience. But I think um, plenty of people still feel that it's shameful and stigmatizing because they think it means there's something wrong with you. I'm, listen, sister. Well, quite honestly, that's how I was raised. Mm. That you, you, you wouldn't go see a quack. Oh, that, wow. those, oh. Yeah, yeah. Why would you go see a therapist, whatever, you know? And, and I actually went in my mid-20s. I started therapy and, you know, got to a point that I, I thought that I was good and stopped. And and then, you know, after having kids and launching a business, I'm like, yeah, there's still shit that needs to be dealt with here. So sign me back up. Um, but yeah, I was definitely raised that you you don't go seek help from a therapist but you know what? She also believed that we we shouldn't really go see doctors unless we're on our deathbeds. So. <laughs> okay, well then that's a whole other level of you know. <laughs> well, a therapist also, you know, that's when it brings up all of really the truth. You know, for me, it was to to go to a, to a therapist was I'm going to speak the truth of this is what happened, and you know, then that meant that everyone had to deal with it. <laughs> it can no longer be shoved under the rug of that didn't happen. Oh, you're a whistleblower. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, potential whistleblower. Hey, yeah. Of, have you are you are you a Netflix person? I am. Okay. Have you watched the series called You Y O U? The guy is like obsessive and he's a stalker. And have you seen that? No. And I don't think I should start tonight that I'm oh, alone. Okay. <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Oh, I'll just tell you quickly. They're in season three right now. And he finally, he was about to kill this woman. Uh, he, he's, he gets obsessed. And then when things don't go right, he, he has to get rid of them. It's, it, it sounds really sick, but it's actually quite funny. Or maybe I'm the one that's sick. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it's very entertaining. But he was about to kill this woman and she confessed that she was pregnant. So they ended up getting married, moving to a bougie Northern California suburb and, you know, having starting to raise their kid. But anyway, they've just killed someone else because it was the neighbor and she was flirting with him and blah, blah, blah. End of, end of the story, they go to couples therapy and they're trying to have a couples therapy session where they don't disclose that they just killed someone. It's actually really entertaining. And have you seen Killing Eve? No, I'm writing these down. I never take notes during oh, a podcast interview, seriously. but I'm actually I'm writing them entertainment down. Entertainment director, Michelle. Okay, so Killing Eve, I think, has moved to a different network. I have been waiting for it to come back for season four, which will be the final season. I just think there is a real shortage of really intelligent programming featuring strong female lead characters. So whenever I find one, I just have to tell everybody about it. Now, Killing Eve has these two female leads who have this incredible relationship and each of them has an incredible personality. But the one whose name is Villanelle, you got to freaking love that, like a Disney character. <laughs> She's in a therapist's office in the trailer saying, I killed two people this week after trying really hard not to. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> and the therapist says, he, he's writing on his pad, he says, that's less than optimal. <laughs> Can you see why I love this? Come yes. on. Yes. <laughs> You've got to check it out and let me know. I will. I'm one of those people that has to see things through to the end. So even if I don't like like a book or, you know, a show. Um, so right now I'm in the middle of, and just like that, the Sex and the City reboot. Mm. And I'm less than enthralled with it, but mm. I've got like three episodes to go. <laughs> so I'm like, I just got to do it. I got to see what happens, even though I'm like, eh. Whatever. <laughs> You're a finisher though. But see, that's I that's am. really, really great because um, excitable personalities like ours, if I may be so bold to speak on both of our behalves. Please do. Sometimes something else comes along that feels more exciting and then that distracts us. So we are better at starting than finishing. But if you've got that gene that you have to finish what you start, even if you're not enthralled, I need to get some of your DNA. I need to maybe scrape some of your skin cells next time we're together or something like that because I sometimes have trouble finishing things once I've fallen out of love with them. I use it as a reward for myself. Hmm. So I'm like, oh, if you finish this god-awful book, then you can start this next one and I swear it's going to be much better. <laughs> and that works. It does for me. Yeah. All right. 
Yeah. And that works for shows or whatever. You know what show we we watched was um, The Shrink Next Door. Did you watch that? No. Sounds like something that should be on my list, though. It should be. It w- It's with um, Will Ferrell and um, Paul Rudd. Oh, that sounds like And it's cast. not what you would expect. And it made me so uncomfortable <laughs> the way Paul Rudd is the therapist and the way he treats Will Ferrell and like bamboozles him into taking his money and stuff. And I just had this pit in my stomach of like, oh my God, this poor guy. And it's based on a true story. There are some unscrupulous therapists out there. I think it's one of the funny things and going back to the subject of therapist versus coach. Even my own husband said, die. You have legitimate credentials. You are a UCLA educated, highly trained, board certified diplomat. Like I had all the serious credentials and I worked in some really high profile places and had a private practice. Like I was, I had a terrific psychotherapist pedigree and I gave all that up to become a coach. Well, yes, as I mentioned previously, I'd outgrown the role. But if you see how therapists are portrayed in the media, and if you have been a really, really good therapist like I have, you have had so many people spend half of their first session with you talking about how God freaking awful their previous therapist or therapists have been. And frankly, the amount of education and training and oversight and supervision and credentialing and continuing education that therapists have to have, I am always shocked to shit when any of them do a real bonehead move like sleep with a client <laughs> or commit some sort of fraud or, but, you know, I did regularly read those listings in the back of the therapist magazines and they are out there. I mean, there are people who are just unqualified. In fact, back in the day, they they actually did away with the licensing, the oral exam through all the professions, psychology, social work, and marriage and family therapy. We used to have to have a written exam and an oral exam. And the oral exam, you would be meet in a hotel room and they would give you a vignette and you would literally from out of your very own brain with no notes, no props, no cheat sheet, say exactly what you would do in like 10 different areas. And 40% of people failed that exam. So what did they do? So they just got rid of it. Oh, well, it sounds See like what the I'm SATs. Saying? Um. See what I'm saying? So we have dumbed down even the profession of therapy by making it possible to become licensed to practice independently in your state on the basis of two multiple choice exams. I got news for you. Human beings are not multiple choice exams. So I really can't blame anybody for taking the quick path and becoming a coach instead because a really, really good therapist is worth keeping close, paying well, and showing a fuck ton of respect to. But they're not all good. And by Mm -hmm. the same token, I have seen a lot of shitty coaches and some really good ones that would put any therapist to task. So it's let the buyer beware marketplace at this point. And you really got to do your homework and trust your gut. Too many people enter into situations and keep going, even though they're not getting their needs met, because they don't have the confidence to trust their own intuition. And I think that can be said for just about any industry. Anything. I mean, you and I were talking about podcast pitching before we started recording and <laughs> it's the same thing there. You know, it's anybody can say they're a publicist, truly anybody. There is not even a multiple choice test for that. It's but, true. You know, and, and it's, it's a shame because, you know, you, you can charge thousands upon thousands of dollars and get absolutely nothing or copy and paste. Well, it goes back to the be like Chad thing is that, you know, even though it's true that many, many women struggle with confidence issues that hold them back, there are some that will boldly proclaim that they are experts when they literally don't know their ass from their elbow and even teach other people to do the same thing. So I think something we chatted a little bit about in the pre-chat is this whole subject of what 
makes someone an expert. Mm -hmm. I think because the internet, social media, all media at this point, digital media in particular, moves and evolves and changes so rapidly that if you've been doing something for a couple of years, that feels like enough. And I just don't, I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I, I'm really uncomfortable with the notion of someone declaring themselves to be an expert in something after a very short time, simply because the standards for what an expert is seem to have completely disappeared with the internet. Yeah, totally agree. Everybody's an expert. Everybody's an influencer. Me, me, me. <laughs> we actually, if you don't declare yourself to be an influencer, you might actually be one. I don't trust anyone who calls themselves an influencer, but I am influenced daily by people who know their shit. It's that authenticity that we were talking yeah. about too. Even it's all coming hate, full circle. Girl, we, we got to come up with another word to replace authenticity because if you have to talk about being authentic, you're not. Yep. But it's just a word that we're used to and everybody is using. I just wish I was clever enough to come up with a word to replace it and then start making everyone use it because I'm tired of that one, frankly. Just being truthful, being yourself, being honest. Genuine. <laughs> Genuine. Yeah, show up as you are. I, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And, you know, you'll see me on my Instagram at five in the morning. And that is truly what it looks like when I've rolled out of bed. <laughs> Girl, those pictures are what I live for. I don't wear makeup in general. You'll see this shortly when I record with you on video. It's just, that's who I am. I, I don't have time for that. <laughs> You're doing serious girl shit. You're doing you're doing entrepreneur shit. You're not you're not you're not teaching makeup tutorials on YouTube. You know? No, that's what my five year old is for. You know, she does that. <laughs> <Let him> work. <laughs> She's like, can I do your nails? Can I do your makeup? I'm like, <laughs> somebody's got to do it. Yeah, because mommy ain't so. <laughs> So what does it look like when someone comes to work with you as a coach? What are they doing with you? What does that look like in general? You know, what's a session like? Or do you have sessions? What is it that you, that all looks like? I'm actually in the midst of, I wouldn't say it's rebranding, but and it's not exactly pivoting either, but just niching down even further. As I mentioned, I work with female solopreneurs who've been successful in corporate, nonprofit, or academia and now struggling on their own. Many of them are coaches. Some are consultants. I've actually also worked with people who've launched product-based businesses, um, encore careers after retirement, you name it. Um, but they share something in common and that is the reason why they hire me is they need to be taking actions that they aren't taking. They know they're qualified. They know that they are actual experts, even if they don't claim to be. They even have a plan, but they may not be executing on it. And my expertise, my bandwidth is, or sorry, my wheelhouse is really using my intuition and my experience and skill to assess what is actually holding them back. Usually it is internalized cultural conditioning and our own female hormones, which help get in the way, <laughs> and the unholy trinity, as I mentioned, of um, perfectionism, procrastination, and people-pleasing. But where I'm learning that I am most effective and I love coaching around because it frees up so much potential, which turns into profit, is boundaries. Better boundaries in business. Women in general have a really hard time putting themselves first, mm -hmm. telling other people no, or mm -hmm. even telling them not now. And this is across the board with family, friends, um, team members, potential clients. We think that we need to be there for everybody on demand. And we have a hard time actually identifying our value and charging appropriately and all the things. So Better boundaries in business is becoming kind of the thing that I am really, really enjoying coaching people on. And I'm probably going to be declaring that a lot more publicly in the future because I just see what a difference it makes. I just helped a client like double her income 
by making one change in the way she relates to people. And she kind of knew she needed to change it, but really didn't know how. And Mm -hmm. I was literally in tears when she told me, it worked, it worked. And I'm like, I know it works, but (laughs) it's great when you actually get to see it. Sometimes people don't put things into practice when they learn them from you. And I hear from them two months later. I've helped people build businesses, pivot businesses, close businesses. And another specialty is when they got too many things going on in their business to make it right-sized and not overwhelming Mm because they want to do all the things. So I've been working with people one-on-one for the last several years and I am getting ready to launch a mastermind for more experienced female entrepreneurs who don't need me every week and would really benefit from being part of a cohort of other badasses all helping raise each other's boats. I love that. And I totally agree with you on the boundaries. It's something I've had to work on, especially coming from the corporate side where you had to, I had to be on. I was always on. I was always answering emails uh, to the point that I actually had a manager who told another manager, he was like, wait, somebody said something about me cooking. And he goes, what do you mean cooking? Like, how? She's she's like a techie person. She doesn't know how to like run a home and stuff. And the other manager's like, you have no idea who Michelle is. She's like a cook and like a mom. <laughs> but because I was always on and responding and doing all these other things, he just assumed that I was just like a non-hands-on type of person. <laughs> so those boundaries are important to learn to shut it down, to turn it off, to close the office door, walk away, you know, take your Fridays and not have appointments. It's stuff we all have to learn. And not only that, Michelle, I would say the the kind of boundaries I'm also talking about are where we, we take too many clients at a friends and family discount mm. or we don't say no when we do a discovery call with someone and we know they're not a good fit (laughs) and they want to work with us so bad we say yes anyway. Like when I look at the the boundaries, I'm thinking about being able to say no, being able to say not now, being able to turn down opportunities to do things that might be great for the other person, but not great for you. Like the whole thing. And that requires us to really think differently about our time, our energy, and how we deal with obligations and expectations. And that's a lot of mindset work that most of us won't do until we feel the pain of not doing it. So, you know, but I'm not afraid of pain and um, I like I like a challenge. I love it. Can you share with everyone where they can find you and join this amazing mastermind cohort that you are about to launch? They can go to my website at Diane Wingert Coaching. Diane is a funky spelling, D-I-A-N-N. So Diane Wingert Coaching, I'm sure you'll link to that in the show notes. Yep. And I would love it if you'd follow me on Instagram at Coach Diane Wingert and check out the Driven Woman podcast, which is really for ambitious women falling short of their goals and some good inside info on what to do about it. Thank you so much. I've loved it. I've loved it more. (laughs) Okay, we're going back to that. Okay. (laughs) I could literally talk to Diane all day. And secret fact, we actually chatted for over two hours when we recorded this episode and only stopped because I had to pick up my tiny humans. Friend, are you ready to do the work? Whether it's with a therapist or a coach, how can you start moving forward and achieving your goals? I can't say enough good things about Diane. So if you think she's someone you want to work with, then go seek her out. She's helping entrepreneurial women unlock their brilliance. And that in itself is a gift. It's time you unlock your brilliance and share it with the world. Share your gift and stop keeping it a secret. Do the work, seek the help you need and deserve, and unlock your potential.